Okay, hello everyone, how are you? Um, so, we keep going with uh, these presentations of papers, uh, for now mainly about patronets. So, um, I don't know if you've been following along, but in the last week or so, um, I published a video uh, of a paper about uh, guarded patronets, and then a video about uh, mana nets, which are another extension of Petronet we we came up with uh, and they both followed the same recipe there was this contrast between uh, an internal semantics uh, for the extension and an external semantics that was obtained by um, taking just a standard Petronet and encoding all the additional information we wanted to model into a functor this time we keep going with this, uh, with this approach. Uh, we, by the way, think um, that this approach has a lot of gas still in the tank, a lot of stuff that can be said. So in this paper, uh, that is again with uh, Fosco and Daniele, uh, we are going to show how we can um, obtain model bounded nets with uh, our functorial semantics. So first question, what is a bounded net? Um, okay, so do you remember that a patronet is basically made of places and transitions, right? Um, and the idea is that I can put tokens in the places and the transitions, you know, will consume these tokens and move them around like so. Cool. Now, you notice though that um, in principle I can put as many tokens I want in a place. I could put 47 tokens here and 6 tokens here. I'm using numbers because like growing 47 dots is going to be uh, non-trivial. Um, but you see like this net is what we call bounded in the sense that after I told you how many tokens are in each place you can basically set a maximum cap for each place so in this configuration we know that this net this place here will hold at most 47 tokens and this one will hold at most 47 plus 6 tokens and this happens precisely when this transition here fires 47 times. On the contrary, a net like this one will, you know, be unbounded like this. Uh, since this transition doesn't have any precondition to fire, uh, this place here can be filled literally with as many tokens um, as you want. Um, okay, so asking an, if a net is bounded or not is uh, something useful to do in, you know, sometimes in, in patron research that can be an important question to ask. And I mean, since pretty much forever, uh, people devised a way to turn a patron net into a bounded net. So how do we do that? Well, it showed here. Let's suppose that we have this patronet here. By the way, this net could be already bounded or not. It doesn't matter. This procedure works for every net. So we start with this. And how do we bound it? Well, we add more places. Precisely for each place in the net, we add another one that has the same domain and codomain, like the same inputs and outputs as the place we, we started from. But inverted. So what does it mean? Well, for instance, the idea is that, um, you know, let's suppose that I have this, right? So in this net, I have two transitions and one place. And this net is clearly unbounded um, because, uh, you know, this transition here in the top can fire as many times as we want before the one in the bottom 
fires to burn the tokens we introduced. But with this procedure, what we do is we introduce a new place. We call these anti places. I don't think that's a common name. We just, I think we just came up with it. But, and we invert inputs and outputs. So you know now instantly the this transition here in the top has a precondition, and this transition here in the bottom has a post condition. So basically, we turned this kind of line patronet here into a cycle, and now you see that the maximum number of tokens that each place can have is given by the sum of the tokens in these two places. So for instance, if I put uh, six tokens in here and three tokens in here, then you see that both places will have a maximum of nine tokens. So we can say instantly that the net is nine bounded. Okay, cool. So we thought, nice, we, we like this idea. How can we uh, define it categorically? Like, I mean, obviously, this is a patronet and this is a patronet. So, I mean, these are both free symmetric monoidal categories or free commutative monoidal categories, depending on your taste. But can we relate them somehow categorically? Obviously, the answer is yes, otherwise we wouldn't have a paper to present. Um, so, before diving into it, um, I have to tell you something about um, common and individual token philosophy, collective and individual token philosophies. I think I uh, hinted at this thing in uh, our previous presentations, in our previous videos. But in here, this is going to be particularly important. And, and so I will show you um, precisely what I mean. So the main difference between common token and like collective token and individual token philosophy is the way you interpret tokens. So what do I mean is that if I have a place, I have two tokens in here, I have a transition, uh, in here, I have another one. Yeah, let's suppose let's take this net here, okay? So, you see that, now suppose that this token here is processed by this transition here in the top, and this token here is processed by the transition here in the top, in the bottom. And then, let's suppose that I fire the last transition just one time. So. In the collective token philosophy, what you say is that it doesn't matter which of the two tokens is fired by this transition, while in the, in the individual token philosophy, it matters. So, uh, for instance, just to give you an idea of why both are useful, in chemistry, we can use patronets to represent reactions. And the point is that chemical, chemical elements and molecules are basically indistinguishable so if your transitions here are re reactions, basically what this means is that it doesn't matter how you get there. As soon as you are here, you have two, mm, you know, two resources, two molecules, which are the same. And then it doesn't matter this last reaction here, which one of the two co um, consumes, because they are indistinguishable, like their history doesn't matter. While in, the, in computer science, um, you could represent these places as um, data types, for instance. So I could have NAT and bool, for instance. And now you see that distinguishing between tokens matters because um, tokens in this interpretation are terms of a given type. So this token here could signify three this token here could signify four, for instance, and a token in bool can be zero or one, and transitions here are functions. And so you want to distinguish because, you know, applying the same function to three or to four may have a different outcome. Um, even if you start with the same tokens, let's suppose that these are both 
um, one and this is doing plus one and this is doing plus two you see that they start the same but in here they will have value um, two and three respectively and maybe this mm, yeah sorry this should be not to make sense of this okay um, yeah and maybe this transition here wants to do different things with two and three so you know uh, in this respect it matters to distinguish tokens so how does this translate to what we do well categorically the only uh, difference is that if you want the commutative token the sorry the common token philosophy collective tokens philosophy you generate a commutative monoidal category out of your patronet and if you want the individual token philosophy you generate a symmetric strict monoidal category out of your patronet um, so this is related with this idea that i already covered in other videos that you can generate monoidal categories out of a patronet and the way we do it is easy we basically take the places of the net to generate the monoid of objects of our category which is either a free monoid or a free commutative monoid depending on your token philosophy and an object will represent um, a marking in your net so for instance in here we have pi1 pi2 pi3 pi3 this means exactly like you see up here one token in pi1 one token in pi2 two tokens in pi3 and transitions now generate morphisms so you see that now for instance I'm firing T and I do this by adding a T morphism in my monoidal category and now you see that a string diagram is a sequence of firing clearly if your category is commutative the point is it doesn't really matter how you switch these tokens around like if I introduce a symmetry here between pi3 and pi3 since you know symmetries are the identities it doesn't really matter how I switch things around um, while in the individual token philosophy in symmetry monoidal categories it matters symmetries matter um, I published a paper with John Bias, Jade Master and Mike Schulman very recently about all this and we really go into a painful amount of detail uh, to show how all this works so if you are interested you can go there and check um, but yeah in here suffices to say that we will consider both philosophies and since the bounded construction is important in both you know computer science chemistry and stuff like that we will consider both and unsurprisingly the commutative case is easier while the symmetric case is harder because symmetries are always a pain in the butt basically um, okay so um, yeah notice by the way that in a commutative um, monoidal category you do not have that wires in string diagrams represent causal relationships between things so for instance in a commutative monoidal category these two diagrams here are the same which is very strange because in here we are saying g is consuming the output of f while in here it isn't yet they are considered the same so you see that the notion of causality is really weakened in commutative monoidal categories okay so the first thing you can prove again we do things in the collective token philosophy the first thing you can prove is that basically um, this um, this bound construction um, gives you a, a co-monad um, so how does it work well uh, we take a net n we generate the commutative free commutative strict monadal category out of it um, and you see that now we generate a new category that we call cb c bounded of n and basically we just duplicate duplicate the generating places so for each generating object a in cn we add uh, object we add object generators a plus and a minus in um, cbn um, clearly a plus represents a and a minus represent the anti-place corresponding to eight to a that we added 
and for each generating morphism that will be a thing like so we add uh, we have a morphine generator in CBN uh, where you see that I'm taking all the B's, I'm putting a minus and I'm putting them here and I'm doing the same with the A's here. So this is exactly what we have in this picture here. We have added a generating object for this and for each generating morphism, so for each transition, we added these inputs and outputs. Okay, and basically you can prove that this is a co-monad. Uh, this is a rather easy proof because you don't have symmetries around so you can just like prove it manually so we spelled out in detail who's the co-unit who is the co-multiplication we proved that laws also everything is fine okay now we want to play the same game we played in uh, mana nets and in guarded nets and this game is defining the same thing in a type of where Fashion. So you see that in here, I have a net n, I generate c of n, then I generate c b of n, and basically, since this is still a free commutative strict monoidal category, um, you see that basically there is another n and net m that presents this category. So basically you can prove that CB of N is equal to C of M for some M. And guess what? This M is exactly the bounded net we obtain with our construction. But you know, this construction is somehow not type aware um, in the sense that basically we are throwing places and anti-places both in the same bucket and we are losing distinction of them. Like, you know, as soon as I give you C, B of N, like categorically, you just see it as C of M. You, you lose track of the fact that this is an extension of C of N and stuff like that. So we want a type aware way of doing this construction. And the trick is always the same. The trick is taking our C of N and encoding the bound stuff uh, into a functor. So this functor here will be a lax monoidal lax functor and it will go to span the category of sets, spans and span morphisms between them. So what is this? Okay, so sets are our objects. A morphism of sets is a span. A span is nothing more than a couple of functions, f and g, like this. And you see this definition is symmetric, so you have already very nice stuff in this category. You have a dagger structure, you can invert a and b, you can do a lot of stuff. This category is like compact close, it's hypergraphs, it's really well behaved. And um, what are what is a two cell? Well, a two cell from the span above to the span below is nothing more than an alpha function between S and S prime, so that this diagram commutes. Okay, so uh, we want to encode into let's say, we said we want to encode the bound stuff into this functor, which is lux, monoidal lux. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, the idea is basically uh, spelled out here in definition seven. So um, we are mapping, we have to say, remember C of N is free. Um, we have to say where every object goes. Well, every object goes into the monoid of objects of CN. We denote this with uh, S plus. This is a free commutative monoid, basically. So A is going in the set of all the objects of CN. Um, and 
what about a morphism so in here if we are, if I have a morphism that goes from A to B B will go to the same object because all objects are sent to the same thing and now we have to say where F is sent and F is sent to expand that we denote in this way so who is chi f to the minus one um, we define chi up here and the idea is that um, basically what chi does is it takes any morphism in our commutative free commutative strict monodal category and maps it to a multi-set over the generators of the category, so over the transitions of the net. And this multi-set is just counting how many times a given generator is used. So for instance, if we go here, these two things are sent to the multi-set that is one in F, one in G, and zero everywhere else. This is, you know, one in T, one in V, one in U, and so on. So this thing is counting, basically, nothing more, nothing less. And up here, we have exactly the anti-image of this. So we are sending this F to the set of all the string diagrams that agree with F, that use the same morphisms, the same generating morphisms that F uses. And these legs here are source and target. So how do we represent this? How do we make sense of this? Well, it's very similar to what we did to mana nets. So remember, each place is it goes into the same object, S+. Plus. This means, if you go back to the guarded nets paper, that we are interpreting this as saying that S plus is the set of properties that a given token in a place can have. And in here, you see the property is what? The property is being an object of S plus, being an element of S plus. So each token basically knows how much places are, how much tokens are in the anti-places. So for instance, P1 here knows that there is one token in the anti-place corresponding to P1 and four tokens in the anti-place corresponding to P3. And the token in P2 knows that there are three tokens in anti-Pi1, three tokens in anti-Pi2, and two tokens in anti-Pi3. And now you see, you can prove that, by the way, this functor is lux, monoidal lux, and the luxator is exactly saying that, again, you can merge these things. This is this idea of non-local semantics that we keep pushing and you know the idea is that these tokens here are endowed with properties that are global these tokens know something about the global state of the net and the luxator is exactly telling you that you can merge the knowledge of these couple of tokens and obtain this kind of common thing and now the idea is that a transition can fire exactly when it has enough stuff in the anti-places. So this condition here, you know, target and source are inverted here, is telling exactly that to fire a transition, to consume a token, it must have an anti, a corresponding token in the anti-place, you know. Um, cool. And um, then we proved, like we usually did also for ManaNet and um, um, Guarded Nets, we proved that basically if you take this lux, monoidal lux functor from C to span, so, okay, call this F, and you do the gradient deconstruction of f, then this is exactly CBN. So you see again, uh, doing the gradient deconstruction that in this case actually is the total category, it's like uh, 
bit of a tweak of the grid in the construction in this context where you have lax functors around. When you do that, you get exactly the category you got with the co-monad. So, you know, this basically is the internal version. This is the external version. And the grit and deconstruction witnesses that the two things are the same. And this is, as we already stressed in the paper, in the Mananet paper, this is uh, a consequence of this adjunction here, this equivalence here. Basically, the slice over CN is equivalent to the category of lux functor from CN to span. Um, okay, so this was all smooth. We had a very pretty intuitive way of defining our F down here. We had a pretty intuitive way of defining CBN up here. So now we want to do the same with the individual token philosophy. And the idea is very simple, right? You say, okay, now I just have three symmetric monoidal categories going around. Um, and you know, I will have a free B of N and that's it. Uh, everything should work because span is symmetric, so there shouldn't be any problem, right? Well, because now symmetries are non-trivial, proving stuff is way, way harder. So, for instance, you can give a definition of the of this free BN, which is exactly as we did for CBN, um, is exactly the same thing. We duplicate the places, we edit the domain and codomain of generating morphisms, but we do it in a free category, a free symmetric monodal category, and not any more free commutative. And then you want to prove again that you have a comonad. Well, the proof is way, way harder and very difficult to do manually because you have these symmetries around. So, and you know, symmetries are like somehow slimy. They tend to slide when you do the calculations. And so it's very difficult to keep things fixed and prove that diagrams commute. So indeed to prove this, we had to resort to, you know, higher level method and and basically the proof of commonadicity of this comes exactly from the fact that this construction here is a pullback. So the idea is that, you know, I have this and I said, okay, now I can do the grid and deconstruction in here. But what is this? Well, you can prove that this is actually obtained uh, as a pullback between F and this, this is the inclusion, uh, sorry, the forgetful functor, and from partial spans or pointed spans to span. So this is basically a span of pointed sets. Um, and you know, if you do this pullback here, what you get is this uh, F here. So this thing is a pullback, uh, and as such it has, you know, the usual universal property, and, and so to prove commonadicity now, um, you know, to prove what units and co-units are, we basically had to use the fact that this uh, grid index of F is exactly 3BN. And so 3BN satisfies a universal property and everything works. So this thing relies to proving that these two things are the same. And uh, why are they the, za the same? Well, again, by definition, because, you know, in the symmetric case, proving that this F here, uh, like defining this F here is super hard. Again, because you have symmetries around, so, you know, we tried to give some intuitive definitions of F and they didn't work because every time some axiom was failing. And the point is that we don't have to because what we have is this. We have free B of N that we know how to construct. We have this functor here and this functor works in the obvious way, just sends every anti-place to the monoidal unit. 
So you see that, for instance, um, yes, let's suppose, let me write it this way. Um, yes, let's suppose I have this. Now I have an anti place here. I'm sending this anti place to the monoidal unit. And as you can see, I'm basically forgetting of uh, forgetting it. And this down here is the net I start from. So we have this functor. I think we called it sigma. Um, and then the idea is how do we define this lux functor here? Well, this is just like gamma sigma. And where remember that gamma is the functor that goes from cat over free of n to free of n span lux. You can prove that this functor here is this gamma sigma is lux monoidal lux. Then you know we have pointed spans here. We have a forgetful functor. And when we take the pullback, um, up here we will have Grittendieck of gamma of sigma that by definition is exactly equivalent to 3b of n. So you see, we didn't have to construct explicitly this thing because it's our underlying theory that gives us the way this thing is built and then we can rely on the fact that free b of n uh, and this functor sigma is are part of this universal construction to show that basically we have a co-monad so the fact that the our co-unit this sigma is the co-unit of the co-monad is part of this pullback square automatically gives us a sensible way of defining um, the co-multiplication and to prove that everything works. So this is what we did. Um, and you see, um, yeah, this is exactly what I was telling you about. And I mean, this is mainly the paper. Um, the very interesting part of it is that um, is this I think this is the major contribution of this paper so this says that because of this equivalence here this is gamma and this is Grittendieck because of these adjoint equivalence here basically studying the categorical semantics of extensions of petronets amounts to classifying lax functors from C to span with C3. So let's unpack this. Um, basically, the idea here is that um, if your category is free, it is presented by a patronet, right? And we showed that you can represent extensions of patronets as things that collapse to this category. And the point is exactly that these things are equivalent because of what we said to um, lax monoidal functors from C to span. And so if we classify, if we study these functors, we are also classifying all the possible flavors of extensions of patronets. And that's exactly the road we are pursuing at the moment. Um, and as I you know, hinted in our, my previous talk, for instance, one thing that we are almost sure we can do is nets with inhibitor arcs, which is quite surprising actually, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think that's mainly it for now. So. Uh, I am already dramatically over time, so I really hope you enjoyed this, and um, we will see each other again, I think, in a week for the last installment of this first batch of papers we are releasing.
thank you everyone and have a nice day